For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we are just made so mindful how dependent we are upon you. Even as we've just read this scripture right here, as it relates to the freedom that we have in Christ, we have a freedom to act as Christ. And I pray that this is what we will get as our pastor brings the word of life to us, that it's not freedom to do as we please, but it, now we have the freedom from sin to act as we ought. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Thank you, Harvey. You can open your Bibles to that passage in Galatians chapter 5, just three verses, verse 13 through 15. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 13. And as you do that, I want to talk to you this morning about a concept or a phenomenon, maybe defined by one of those big words recidivism. Yeah, you might not know that one. Recidivism. What is that? It refers to a person's tendency to relapse into criminal behavior. In other words, it's the tendency to become a repeat offender. So let's use our imagination for a moment. Let's imagine for a moment that you rob a bank. You go in, guns blazing, give me all your money, this is a stick up. They Sound the alarm, the police start coming, you, uh, you run out of the bank with your white bag, sagging with cash, you get in the getaway car with your buddy who's waiting on you, there's a high speed chase, you go down the uh, expressway, police are after you, they lay out the tire strips with the spikes and they bust your tires, you crash, they come, they apprehend you, they cuff you, they throw you into the back of the car, they haul you off to jail, and you're caught. And the day of your trial comes and you stand there before a jury of your peers, nationalized television because you made such a big scene, and uh, they pronounce the verdict, you're guilty. And of course you are because there you are on camera and everybody knows that you did it. And they give you a sentence. Let's say you get off real easy and they give you a 10-year sentence. And then you're in prison and you have no freedom. You can't go where you want to go. You can't do what you want to do. You can't eat what you want to eat. There's no grocery lists, nothing like that. You're stuck. You can't get out. You're a prisoner, literally. And you wait and you wait and life goes on. And then as the day gets closer for you to be released, all the apprehension, the anticipation is building. You're looking forward to being released. You've been in there for 10 years. You want to see your family aunts, uncles, parents, children. You haven't seen them except for just visits in the, in the prison visitor area, whatever they call that. And uh, you're really looking forward to being out. And I know it doesn't quite work like this, but just imagination. Just use your imagination. The day finally comes. They come to your cell. They stick in the key. They turn the lock. It snaps open. They open the door. You still got your cuffs on. They walk you out. I know it's not like this, but let's say they walk you out to the front door. They open the door. The sun's shining in your face. They reach behind your back, they unlock your cuffs, they let them go, and they say, you're free. You can go. And then they walk back in the prison, and they close the door, and there you are, for the first time in 10 years, finally free. And then this question, of course, is now incumbent upon you, what are you going to do with your freedom? You have your freedom. In that moment, you are a free person. But what are you going to do with your freedom? Now, that big word, recidivism, in Tennessee, very tragically, the recidivism rate over a three-year window, how, how many people end up back in prison after, within a three-year period of having been released? The answer is almost 50%. It's really sad. It's tragic. It's terrible. These are broken people. It's another story. If we can serve and help them, we should. But 50% almost, I think 47 is the number that I saw, or maybe that was the year 2021, almost half of people released from prison will be back 
in prison, reincarcerated, before three years pass. In other words, freedom is a good thing, but how you use your freedom is a totally separate subject. That's the question. How are you going to use your freedom? Having it isn't sufficient. Once you have it, you've got to use it somehow. And that's what the Apostle Paul is telling the Galatians. You are free. That's what he's been saying for quite a while, right? I said before, he's got this one really long nail, and he's been just hammering it into this block of wood from every different angle with every different hammer. He's hammering the same nail. You're free in Christ. You're free from the Mosaic law. There is no condemnation for you. You do not have to keep the law. In fact, if you try to keep the law, you're giving up on trusting Christ, right? You are free in Christ. And in, in today's passage, there's a hinge. He changes the flow of thought in the letter to the Galatian churches. It's no longer, you are free, you are free. The rest of the letter is, how now shall you live? How now will you use your freedom? That hinge is our sermon text for today. He's going to spend the next chapter and a half telling them how to use their freedom. He's going to tell them what freedom is for. So let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. Because if we believe that we're Christians, we stand in the same shoes as all the Galatians stood. And we too are free. And we too have that same choice before us. How are we going to live? How are we going to steward the freedom that God has given to us? Let's ask him for help. Father, we confess that it's true that we were slaves of sin. John 8, Jesus said, whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. Nobody in the room would claim never to have sinned. Therefore, on the word of Christ, we confess to you, our Father, that we were slaves of sin. Not people who sin sometimes, slaves of sin. We also confess the assurance that we have two verses later Jesus said if the son makes you free you will be free indeed Lord we feel like that sometimes so sin seems so big we do things we can't imagine we would have done we are like Peter I would never do that I would never do that and then we do it and uh, we also praise you that with that as the backdrop that the Lord Jesus is the great liberator, the great shackle buster of men. By his cross, by his resurrection from the dead, having paid all the penalty, every penalty that could ever be required for our sin, he paid it all by his shed blood and his broken body. And so freed us from the law, from the curse of the law, from your judgment, from your wrath, from fear of death, freed us from all of it. There's freedom in him. We praise you for that, Father. We want to rest in that. We want to rejoice in it. We don't want to minimize it. We don't want a dimmed down version. We want the full brightness of the noonday sun, the freedom and glory of Christ for his people. Help us, Lord. That's what we need. Thank you for this church. Not just an individual who's free somewhere, but a local community of people free in Christ together, rejoicing in him and his salvation. Thank you for the small group ministry of this church. Thank you for the group that meets at the Lewis home led by our brother Kevin Thank you, Father. Use this group. Help them, like the Galatians needed help, to remember that they are free in Christ, not bound by the law. Their actions neither give them merits nor condemn them, but they must rest in Christ. Use their group to bless them that way. Thank you for other churches in the area. We think of Audubon Park Baptist Church down there in Memphis. Thank you for Rich Shadden. Lord, I pray you'd bless these souls. Thank you for the Fulani people in Nigeria, these often nomadic people, almost all Islamic, very traditional in Nigeria, war-torn country, a lot of civil war, a lot of even persecution and murder of Christians. There's a lot there, Lord. We remember the Apostle Paul, his breathing out murderous threats against the church. We pray for this people, Lord, the Fulani. We want... We know you will do it. We look forward to the day when you do it, when on the last day every tribe and tongue and people and nation, including the Fulani, are there to give glory to Christ for eternal life. Lord, we pray also for you taught us, those who are in authority. We think of our judicial system, particularly the state of Tennessee's judicial system. 
Lord, I pray for grace, even thinking of car, car crashes after bank robberies and all the just crazy stuff that you use people like judges in. So we pray that you would cause them to do justice and uh, where they're not believers, that you would regenerate souls and uh, that they would put their faith in Christ. Lord, this passage about freedom and love and serving and even the temptations to sin against one another, Lord, help us. We want not only to understand the passage, Father, we want to embody the passage. So help us, cause us to do that. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll divide our text into three parts for the morning. The first will be the context. We'll just look briefly. The second and third points will be Paul's two choices for how to live as a freed person. If you're free in Christ, you could go this way or you could go this way. That's our second and third points. Option one, point number two, love one another, serve one another. And then option three, instead of that, bite and devour one another. That's really your choices. So our first point is the context. There's not much more to say here except that we just need to connect. I've already done it a little bit. This week's passage with last week's passage. If you let your eyes fall on the verse, verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5, you'll notice that it begins with that word for. And I've said many times, and I will probably continue to say, that the word for basically means let me explain. And so that means you're under obligation as a reader of the Bible to make sense of what Paul's saying and understand what he is explaining and how the explanation explains what sense does it make. Well, he's just been saying these troublemakers want to take free people and enslave them all over again. And he's been talking about how God won't tolerate that, but that people who do that kind of thing to the people of God will bear their judgment. God himself will see to that. That's what's going to happen. The troublemakers will bear their guilt. And Paul uses his very strong language at the end of our passage from last week in chapter 12. The troublemakers are going to use evil means and God will bring on them righteous judgment to hold them accountable. For, let me explain, you were called to freedom. So he's transitioning. He's transitioning. Why is, in other words, why is it so bad for the troublemakers to try to enslave the Galatians. It's bad because God willed it the other way. It's bad for them to enslave the Galatians because God said they're free. That's the explanation. Strong language is explained by the fact that they're against the purposes of God. God's called the Galatians to freedom. And so Paul transitions. How are you going to use your liberty? Liberty, pardon me. Our second point is the option, the first option, they're to love one another. Love one another. Look at verse 13 again. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. That will be our third point. We'll come back to that. Turning freedom into an opportunity for the flesh or license. Instead, what should they do? This is option one. Through love, serve one another. And we'll come back to that license to sin part. But for now, let's focus on the good path that Paul is urging, appealing, maybe commanding, I think, the Galatians to take. Love saturated service to one another. Love saturated serving to one another. There are three ideas there. There is liberty. There's love. And their service. We'll take them one at a time. The first is liberty. We've been talking about that a lot. Liberty, Paul's been talking about it a lot. So have we. Paul tells them that they're free. And of course, I began with this illustration of being freed from prison. So it's sort of obvious in that context. From what you're freed. What does Paul mean when he says, you're free? You have liberty in Christ. What does Paul mean by that? You were called to freedom. I don't know what you think about when you think about being free. Maybe you think about just being able to do whatever you want, whenever you want. You could sleep in. Other people would cook your breakfast and bring you coffee. 
You have no obligations. You don't have to get up and go to work or work hard. No yard work maybe, no dishes maybe, whatever it is you don't like. Things you don't have to do and a bunch of things I do want to do, I get to do them all. I'm free. In other words, I can do whatever I want to do. Or maybe you don't think like that when you hear you were called to freedom. Maybe you think something more, it has to do more with you and the kind of person you are. Like nobody tells me what to do. I'm my own man. I'm my own master. Nobody's master over me. Don't tread on me. And you think of freedom or liberty mainly in terms of nobody from out there can encroach upon me in an unjustified, immoral, and wrong way. I'm a free man. Maybe that. Or maybe you think of our really awful, horrific American system of chattel slavery. We have that as a significant part of our, Amer our American history that always looms in the background there. And so when we think of slavery and freedom, for many of us, that's what comes to our mind. We define freedom in terms of that sort of oppressive, brutal slavery and not being enslaved in that way. And that's what you think of when you think of freedom. I don't know. You could think of a lot of other things. What do you think Paul meant? When Paul said, you were called to freedom, or like he said earlier, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and don't be subject to a yoke of slavery. Well, what's the slavery and what's the freedom? What is Paul talking about? Because it does matter, doesn't it? Because a lot of times these days, kind of like Harvey said before he read the passage, or maybe it was when he prayed after the passage, many people these days bow down every single day and worship at the altar of the idol called autonomy. I can do whatever I want. And any person who comes and tells me that I can't do whatever I want to do is oppressive and bigoted. Is that what Paul means? A license to just do whatever you feel like doing at any given moment? Well, you've noticed that I begin every sermon with the context. And that's because many times the context answers questions just like this one. What's the freedom? What's the slavery? Well, what does the context tell you the answer to those questions is? And the answer is that the Galatians are free from the Mosaic law. You are not under the Mosaic law anymore. None of you, whether a Jew or a Gentile, the Mosaic law has no binding authority over you. You are free from underneath it. You're neither bound to keep it nor subject to its penalties. That's the freedom that Paul's talking about. So it would be like this. Let's say, what does it mean to be free from the law, not under the law? Let's say we all, most of us live here in Tennessee or Mississippi or Arkansas, somewhere here, right? And we are therefore, let's just say it's Tennessee, bound by the laws of Tennessee. Well, what if you move to New Jersey? You're no longer bound by Tennessee's laws, right? So if you, we, we have this law that's kind of new, most of us remember it in Tennessee, where it's the hands-free driving law. You're not allowed to hold a phone and talk while you drive. It's against Tennessee law, right? Well, I don't know for sure that New Jersey doesn't have one, but let's just assume they don't have one. And let's say you move to New Jersey. That law is not a New Jersey law, and you're driving down the road talking on your phone. Now, maybe you shouldn't do that, but let's say you are doing it. Can you get a ticket for it in New Jersey because it's illegal in Tennessee? No, of course not. Why is that? Because you're not under Tennessee law. You don't have to go look up Tennessee laws and try to keep them. And if you do something that's illegal in Tennessee, you're not subject to the penalties of Tennessee law. That's what Paul's saying to the Galatians. You are not under the Mosaic law. You don't have to go look up every jot and tittle in there and try to make sure you keep them. In fact, some of the stuff in there you can't keep. Remember what he said about circumcision? You're also not subject to the curse of the law. He said in chapter 3 that Christ became a curse for us. He redeemed us or bought us back from the curse of the law. You are not under the Mosaic law. It is not binding on you. Just like moving to New Jersey means you're no longer under Tennessee law. They're free. They can't be condemned. Don't you know Romans 8? Who is going to condemn you? Find somebody out there to raise your hand to condemn one of the Christians. By what law? By what standard? Christ has already made sufficient payment. He's the one who died. There is no condemnation. That's why Paul can say that. You're not under the law. Therefore, there's nothing to condemn you. Nothing. 
There's no written record waiting to come and condemn you because Paul says that same written decree, that same written record was nailed to the cross with Christ when he died. If you're a Christian, you are free from fear of penalty. You cannot be punished by the law. That's what Paul's telling the Galatians. You're free. Now, when you hear that, I don't know what you think, but you have some options. And that's what this passage is about. How you respond to being free from the law and being free from the threats and curses of the law. That's what the passage is about. How are the Galatians going to respond? Well, what would you do? Let's say if you knew today that you could not be arrested or prosecuted for breaking any laws. What would you do? Say you went out to eat lunch today and you knew nothing bad could happen to you. If you didn't pay, you just walked out. Would you walk out? Or let's say that you really liked your neighbor's car and you had a key and you knew you couldn't go to jail for stealing it. Would you steal it? If you were free from the penalty of the law, how would you live? What would you do? That's what Paul's saying to the Galatians. You are free. There can be no condemnation. And you have two choices about how you could live. If the Galatians hear this, and they're not subject to the law, will they go wild? Is this freedom, this big, broad, expansive, you're not even under the law in the first place, is that a recipe for the dissolution of morality in the churches in Galatia? Will the morality crumble? Will the people become disobedient? Will the restraint be gone? Will the dam burst and all the pent up and held back immoral desires of the Galatian church just flow forth if you tell them they're not under the law anymore? Does the law hold back the immoral desires of the Galatians. Well, the Judaizers would certainly have said the answer to that question is yes. Yes. They would have certainly said that, I believe. The law, they would have emphasized, is a moral restraint, a moral transformer, a moral shaper and life giver into the hearts of the people. Now, there is a sense in which laws are teachers. I'm not talking about that. The law does teach what is moral and what is not moral. So it does matter, like say, Tennessee law, right? We do want laws that say this is good and this is bad. That's true. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the power to obey, the power to change, victory over temptation to sin. Can the law give you that? Can it help you to obey in a way that you couldn't do if you depended only on your own resources, your own self-will. Well, the Judaizers would have said, yes, you can actually go back and read a great deal of early Jewish rabbinic literature, like what rabbis would write. And they emphasize this on the regular, this law, this transformative power of the law, the function of the law to make people moral, to empower godly living in the hearts of people. They would have emphasized this strongly. But is that how it works? Is that true? Is being under and bound by the law transformative for the better? Now, I'll use the example of Old Testament Israel. If any people on the face of the earth in all of history have had the law and been under it more comprehensively than Old Testament Israel, I don't know who they are. These were the most saturated with the law people that I can think of. Now, you tell me, did that saturation with the law, being under the law, produce a righteous people for Old Testament Israel? If you've read your Bibles, you know the answer to that question is clearly no. Their history is one giant downhill slide into degeneracy. That's the reason that the whole kingdom falls apart because they break all the parts of the Mosaic law. Everything recapitulated in Deuteronomy. It all falls apart. God had warned them what would happen when they did it and they did it and God responded just how he said that he would. I mean, terrible. 
horrible things, right? All kinds of immorality, all kinds of idol worship. They even entered into the just gut-wrenching, awful practice of child sacrifice, just like the pagans did to the god Moloch, little g. It didn't make them moral. It didn't transform their hearts. The law couldn't do that. It can't reach into your heart and empower holy living. It can't be done. That was never the purpose of the law in the first place. Remember what we said earlier in Galatians? Why was the law given? Because of transgressions or to increase them, to expose them, right? You put Romans 7, somebody under the law who's an ungodly person, and it inflames and invigorates the sinful passions. That's what the law does. It doesn't inflame and invigorate holiness. It does the opposite. Now, I said last week, I don't know how this landed on some of you. I said last week, you don't have to do ministry to be a Christian. You don't have to be a great evangelist or to do anything in the church to have God's favor. I, maybe that landed on you as strange. I'm not sure. It might have. You don't have to do it. You don't have to share the gospel with your neighbor to have God smile. Maybe it surprised you, but Paul insists again this week that it's true. You were called to freedom from the Mosaic law. You're not bound by the law. You're not in the realm of the law at all. You're not susceptible to its penalties. In other words, if you don't do this or that ministry, there is no rod coming for you from a punishment standpoint. I'm not talking about God disciplining those he loves. I'm talking about judicial penalty, punishment, condemnation. God, and I have to say it now, discipline, God does that because he loves you. I'm talking about God bringing judgment and anger against you because he doesn't, because he's condemning you. You can't bring that on yourself by not doing ministry. You don't have to do it in that sense. There's no threat, no condemnation. You're not in jeopardy of penalty. When you wake up in the morning... The verdict is already in. You are not guilty. I don't know how your day will go, but if you're a Christian, I know no matter what happens throughout that day, when you go to bed, the verdict is still there. It still says, not guilty. That's why I say you don't have to do this or that ministry. It's not if you do it, God will accept you. No, that's to be under the law. That's what Paul is renouncing here. This is the paradox. Not being under the law not having to keep the law, being free from the law, being accepted in Christ regardless of your behavior. That, that provides the power for moral transformation. Being told that you don't have to be obedient to be accepted makes you obedient. That's where the power comes from. That's the paradox. Let's look at verse 13 one more time. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only... Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity through the flesh, opportunity for the flesh, pardon me, but through love serve one another. Now notice, Paul does not throw away the freedom. He doesn't cancel it. He doesn't reel it back in and say, ooh, I let that out a little too far. No, he insists on the freedom. You are free. You are free from the law. I'm just going to tell you how to use your freedom. Paul says, don't say this. I'm free, now I can do all the things which were previously forbidden, forbidden, pardon me, and now I can avoid punishment. Don't say that. Don't do that. Don't live like that. Instead say, I'm free in Christ. I am forgiven. The verdict is in. There is no penalty from the law. There is no condemnation. Now, let me respond to God in worship. Glad-hearted, tearful, I can't believe he loves me this way. Worship. It's my joy to serve him. That's what Paul is urging them to do. But you have to start with the freedom. If you live every day, you should not do this, trying to ensure that you stay in God's good graces by doing your quiet times, and being kind to people, making sure you're fair and just in your dealings, paying your taxes, being a good church member, doing this ministry, doing that ministry, if you live every day trying to make sure that you stay in God's good graces like that, that is the exact same paradigm as living under the law. You are 
maybe even without knowing it, trying to earn what Christ died to give you for free. It's so subtle. It's so subtle. We drift, we slip like a boat. You're on the boat. Here's the dock. Christ is here. You look the other way. You look back, you've drifted out 10 or 15 feet. We didn't, you didn't even feel it. It wasn't perceptible to you. We drift like that, un- imperceptibly into this, I have to make sure that I fill in the blank so that I can be okay with the Lord. We do it all the time. Paul says no. Insist every day that no matter what happens, Christ has set you free by his own bloody death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead so that no matter what comes in the day, You are righteous in Christ. That's what it is to have faith. The order matters. You first rest in the finished work of Christ, and then you obey. If you flip it, there's no salvation there. That's not the way it works. You're earning your salvation. In other words, the soil is the finished work of Christ, and you're having been counted righteous in him, being free from the law in him. That's the soil. From there grows obedience. It has to be like that. you got to have the soil, and the plant's got to grow out of the soil. Now, Paul, I told you there are two options. There's two paths on how to use their freedom. What do you do when you get out of prison and now you're a free man or woman? I said there were three words, liberty, love, and serve. He gives them basically one example, through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. Those are really one thing. Let's look first at the love. Love. Now, love is at the heart of the biblical ethic. God is love. The first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Love is right at the heart of the biblical moral ethic. It's central to all the moral imperatives of Christian living. So Paul, that's why in our passage in verse 14, he quotes that same passage that Jesus quoted, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and that Paul quoted, I think it's Romans 10, and that James also quotes, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. James calls it the royal law, the king's law. Love is right at the center. What do I mean by that? Paul says that love is the fulfillment of the law. The whole law has been fulfilled in this one saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? The whole law is fulfilled in this one saying. I believe what that means is that if you love your neighbor, the second greatest commandment, you can know for sure you are not in violation of any parts of the law. You're not violating Deuteronomy or Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or any other passage in the Torah, the Mosaic Law, so long as you are loving your neighbor. Now, more has to be said, but I think that's what Paul means when he says that. Or, as 1 Peter 4.8 says, love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, you can't love someone and sin against them at the same time. I think that's what Paul's talking about. But I said that takes some explaining, because what is love? Now that, that's a question. That's a question that our whole society is very confused about. It's got to be one of the most misunderstood things in the world today. The definitions multiply like water coming out of a fountain. Everybody means something different when you say L-O-V-E. The famous poet Robert Frost said this about love. Love is an irresistible desire to be irresistibly desired. That's very catchy and false. That's using people for self-gratification. But he called it love. Here's another quote. Love is love. People should be able to do whatever makes them happy. That's Britney Spears, oddly enough. That one is emblematic of today's argument. Love is love. People should be able to do whatever makes them happy. 
In her statement, there is embedded a certain, very clear, even if she doesn't know it, definition of love. She ha you have a definition for every word that you use because you've used it to communicate something. That's what she's doing. People should be able to do whatever makes them happy. But that really has a very crumbly, disintegrating foundation. What if what makes you happy is stealing my car? No. What if what makes me happy is stealing your car? It's foolishness, right? But these things do catch on. They're spoken in catchy ways. And many times they have underneath them presuppositions and assumptions that really resonate with many people. It's more than just a cheap trick. What is love? At its heart, the love of the Bible, the God is love, love, the love your neighbor as yourself, love, the through love serve one another, love, the real love, what God thinks about love, at its heart, love is always others-oriented. You are interested in the welfare and benefit of the other person, and you act on it, even if it means sacrifice for yourself. I will do whatever is necessary to do you good. And that has to be defined too. But to do you good regardless, regardless of what it costs me. That's closer to love. 1 Corinthians 13 says, among other wonderful things, that love, quote, does not seek its own, end quote. There's a lot there. But love doesn't seek its own. It's not self-interested. That's why Robert Frost's statement cannot be love. Love is the irresistible desire to be irresistibly desired. That's seeking your, your own. That's self-seeking. It's using people. But real love doesn't use people. Real love gives to people. Real love blesses people, serves people. When love sits on the throne of your heart, that me monster that rules has died. And instead, now you're thinking of other people. You can finally see them. And you're willing and actually carry it out to bless them. That's more like what love is like. That's why self-sacrifice displays the essence of love so brightly, just like the sun at noon. Such a bright display, self-sacrifice, of what real love is like. So I don't know if any of you, I don't quote a lot of movies, but have seen this movie called The Guardian. It's a movie about, I think it's the Navy or Coast Guard, I don't even remember, but the, the final scene in the movie is just really moving. You have this nighttime scene in the middle of the ocean, you have this rescue operation from a sinking ship. You have the helicopter coming up. And, of course, you have this relationship between the older sailor and the younger sailor, the older training the younger, the younger highly gifted, sort of the prodigy, the Doogie Hauser of whatever branch of the military they were in. There's a lot of conflict, and the story has really developed a lot. And you get to the end, and now they're finally on this mission together, the wise old master sailor and the young buck, highly gifted, and they're going to try and do this rescue. And a lot of things unfold, but at the end, the way it turns out, the two guys have done their water rescue, and they're being hoisted up by a cable into this helicopter. And you have the younger guy up higher, and he's dangling from this metal cable attached to the helicopter. And then you have the older guy, and the younger guy has got hold of the older guy's gloved hand. And, of course, it's a movie, it's all dramatized, but you look up and the cable's not going to hold. It can't hold them both. It's too heavy for two people. And you have uh, the older guy, he sees it. He's dangling down by the hand, glove on the hand. He sees the younger guy holding him. The younger guy is screaming at him, hang on, hang on. And the older guy, he knows what's going to happen. Either they're both going to fall or he's going to do what happens in the movie. And he reaches up, he takes the Velcro on his glove, and he pulls it, and he slips, and he falls down into the ocean, and he's covered by the waves. That is a beautiful picture of love. Self-sacrifice is a brilliant picture of love. That is self-sacrificial, others-oriented, giving concern for somebody else, even when it costs me. Now we're getting close to what love is. I will bless you no matter what it costs me. I will give to you no matter what it costs me. And why do we resonate with stories like that? It's, it's in 
Every great story is some moment like that. Why does that resonate so much? Why are we moved? Why, when I told the story, could you hear a pin drop? It's not about me. It's about the story. Why? Because stories like that have embedded in them something of the glory of Christ. Jesus is the self-sacrificial, giving, others-oriented, I will bless you no matter what it costs me, king of love. The thing that we love about those kind of stories is exactly what Jesus came to do. We love the stories because they're a shadow that's exactly the same shape as the reality of Christ. Jesus' death was not quick and painless and in the ocean. It was a prolonged, intentional suffering. And his was not a sacrifice for the highly talented and the gifted, but for people who hated him, declared, declared and sworn enemies. That's who he loved. That's who he sacrificed for. His sacrifice wasn't merely the suffering of bodily death, the loss of the remainder of life, bodily, but suffering under the anger and judgment, the curse, as we said, of God himself. It's hard to imagine, it's terrifying to imagine, divine, omnipotent anger being poured out. Jesus is the king of love. He said himself, there, nobody has a greater love than when one lays down his life for his friends. Self-sacrifice. There's not a greater love than what Christ did on the cross. Nothing touches it. I love the stories that we tell, the movies, the books. They're all beautiful, and every one of them is a little springboard that shows you the reality of Christ and his great love. Love is central to the biblical moral ethic because it is central to our Savior's character. I said before that love is both a subjective feeling and a practical doing. It's always both. And Paul says basically the same thing in our passage. He says, through love, serve one another. Don't love in sentiment. Through love, do. Through love, serve. Let your love bubble over and spill out in serving one another. Love, show, love shows up and does something. And in the case of our passage, love shows up and serves. Let's think about serving, the word serve. It's a verb. It's used 25 times in the New Testament. What we want is for our understanding of what Paul means in the passage to match what he meant, what the Holy Spirit meant. So this word, the way it's used in the New Testament, sometimes has to do with serving a master. You cannot serve God and wealth. No one can serve two masters. Serving a master. Sometimes it has actually to do with being enslaved or being in bondage. There's more than simply signing up to serve in the nursery on occasion or in the music team. It is that. That's a good thing. But it's more than that. There's more commitment. There's more binding dedication. Paul says, it's as though he says, with love as your guide, be in service to one another. Be bond servants of one another. Live your life with an others-oriented, unshakable dedication to one another. Imagine, can you imagine signing up to be the dedicated servant of another person? Let's say it's a really good person whom you know will treat you right. Can you imagine still signing up to be a servant, like you sign on the dotted line, you can't change your mind, I am your servant. Something like that is what Paul's saying to the Galatians. Be in service. Be bond servants. Be slaves of one another. And maybe you notice, Paul just really gives here, introductorily, this one context about how to use your freedom. And he says, through love, serve. But those next words, one another, serve one another, the only example he gives on how to use your freedom has to do with one another. 
The context there forces you to think about, how do I use my liberty in Christ? I use it with these people. Serve one another. So if you mix the ideas of dedicated service, like a servant to his master, with the idea of serving one another, what do you get? You get a beautiful picture of the church. That's what you get. Paul didn't say, generally, be a servant in all you do and in all places. Paul said, Galatians, serve one another. You get a beautiful picture of the church. So let me just paint the rest of the picture. Imagine a family of faith, all of them resting in Christ, resting in his finished work, Trusting that there's no condemnation, we're free from the law and its curses. No fear of condemnation, fiercely dedicated, not in a fragile, breakable, if it gets hard, I'll leave kind of way, but in a way that a parent would be dedicated even to a wayward child, dedicated to each other, people, loving each other, not in name only, but an others-oriented, I'll even sacrifice, I will die for you kind of way. That's the beautiful picture of the church. The church is a group of people bound together by the cords of gospel love as a family with Jesus as its head. Now, I don't know how you think of church. We don't think of church like that today. We are consumeristic. We are individualistic. We think of it like a gym membership. If the equipment isn't what I like, I cancel it. That does not square at all with the words of Paul. And it certainly doesn't square with the bleeding, dying, undeserved love of Christ in the gospel. It's not how God designed the church. God said, be servants of one another. Love each other self-sacrificially. We make up versions of what the church is like, and we even use those versions to justify doing what we want to do. But God's version is better than our version. God's idea about what the church is is best in the same way that a real tractor is like a toy tractor, but it's the real deal. God's is the genuine article. The church is beautiful. The church is worth giving your life to. The church is worth sacrificing for. Losing things. Losing time. Losing money. Losing, giving lots of things away. The church, the bride is worth it. Jesus loves her that way. He loves her. He loves you. He bled and died for you. He went first in giving stuff up to bless the bride. And he's calling us to do the same thing, to live the same life. That's what the passage is about. Through love, serve one another. And just notice, being free from the law, removing the threat of the law, does not throw a blanket on that kind of love and service. It's the other way around. It's exactly the opposite. Being free from the law, being told you don't, have to love, being told you don't have to serve in the sense of a penalty coming, being told you don't have to do those things to earn God's favor is what will, if it's real, it will produce in you irresistibly a desire to love and serve. Resting in Christ is first. This pours gasoline on the fire. Being told that you're free will make you a free giver of love and service. That's option one, what to do with your freedom. Through love, serve one another. What about option two? Paul ends the passage with a warning. The picture is very bleak. The three words that he used are often used, like in the Old Testament, for example, in the context of animals like snakes biting. And there's a progression. If you bite, and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed. Bite, devour, totally consumed. There's a progression, right? First there's the biting, then there's the tearing and the ripping up of flesh, and then finally the whole thing is completely swallowed or consumed and is gone. This Galatians, this cross point, could be us. Happens all the time. 
Instead of the vibrant and golden glow of gospel love emanating from a congregation for the whole world to see the light set on the hill, Paul warns of shrieks and howls, biting and tearing, ripping and gnawing. Don't do that, Galatians. Don't do that, cross point. This would be the abuse of liberty. This would be, back to verse 13, using your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So I know of a young man who was taken in by his grandparents. He was a, kind of a wayward young man. His grandparents loved him and were willing to sacrifice for him. They took him in. He lived there. They nurtured him. They cared for him. No telling how much money they spent, food, everything else. He did all that. He received all that only to respond to their kindness by using his free access to their home to rob them of their family heirlooms. That's what Paul's warning against. Using grace, kindness, and freedom to turn around fangs bared on the person who set you free. That's what Paul's warning them against. That's an awful thing. It's Paul's warning. He doesn't back down from the freedom. He doesn't reel it back in. No, the freedom stays. He doesn't threaten them with curses of the Mosaic law and the judgment of God. His threat is, if you do this, be careful, beware, look out, that you're not totally consumed by one another. He doesn't say, if you act that way, if you bite and devour each other, the law will come back from the dead to condemn you. No, that ship has sailed. Paul meant what he said when he said the law can't come back. The consequence is mutual self-destruction. Like the same thing that was so often talked about in the Cold War with the nuclear threats that were there. Mutually assured destruction. That's what Paul's worried about. You will destroy each other. But he's talking about biting and devouring. The picture that Paul uses is of something like two great snakes in a terrible coral ripping and tearing each other until they're both left in tatters bleeding out dead and no more. He doesn't want the Galatians to be that. Watch out, Galatians. Don't misuse your freedom in Christ. That's a stiff warning. If you view freedom as something that enables you to sin, and you use it as an excuse to sin, I'm free, therefore, I can fill in the blank. Hebrews calls this going on sinning willfully, on purpose. Not That's very different from resisting temptation. Every sin you commit, you commit consciously. You do it. But there's still a difference between that and someone who just with a seared conscience willfully goes on sinning, on purpose, not resisting temptation. Those are separate things. That's what Paul's warning about. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity to do those fleshly things that a carnal man would want to do. If you live like that, you'll end up bitten, devoured, and in the gullet of the vultures. That's a tragic thing because so many churches are just like that. Maybe you're visiting with us today and you're thinking, I know churches that sound a lot like that. I should say, I'm so sorry that's the case. There are many people who write C-H-U-R-C-H on the front out there. They preach a false gospel. There's no hope. There's no freedom from the law. There's all kind of problems. I'm wanting to tell you that the Lord Jesus said there would be people who claim his name and don't belong to him and that what you see reflected in the lives of churches like that, full to the brim of toxic ooze, are not reflective of the character of Christ. They are not. He's not like that. He's full of the kind of love I talked about before, self-sacrificial, truth-saturated, goodness and blessing for his people, full fidelity, no hypocrisy. That's the Lord Jesus. But a lot of churches are like that. The halls of the church building sound like the streets outside. Gossip, slander. We could think about the tongue for a minute. That's just one example, that your tongue and the words that it forms. What would people who know you who talk to you a lot, say if somebody asks them about how you use your mouth. 
your tongue and the words it forms, do your words have the ring of love in them? Do they soar forth with an intentional mission to bless the hearers? Or are they more like Proverbs 18 and they come out like the sharp thrusts of a sword hurting the people who hear what you say? That's an example of how we can bite and devour one another. James commanded us to be slow to speak. It's not a personality thing. It's a command of the one true and living God. Be slow to speak. A fast, careless, heedless tongue is a loveless tongue. I don't care much what happens to the people who hear what I say. I just speak my mind. Those things go together. But what about loving others-oriented service of one another with your tongue? We say sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You know that's not true, right? That is not true. The proverb itself says, 12.18, that... Rash words are like thrusts of a sword. Words do hurt us. How many people have been turned inside out by the destructive words of others? Manipulative, deceptive, soul-distorting words of a spouse or a parent. Words hurt us. They work like the fangs of the viper or the canines of the jaguar. They bite, they hurt, they wound, they rip, they tear. Your words matter. You have actually a lot of power in your words to build up or to tear down. That's just one example, words. The passage is not all about words. I tried to think of one example of how we could bite and devour one another. Next week, our brother Millard's going to preach for us on the, the passage that follows right here in Galatians, and we're going to get a lot more examples of what it might look like to use freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. How opposite are love and biting and devouring one another. My goodness. The flesh tears apart, but love builds up. The flesh rips and destroys, but love heals. The flesh takes, and love gives. The flesh rains down curses, and love blesses. The flesh incessantly thinks of being served, but love serves when nobody's watching. The flesh consumes and love produces and distributes. They're so opposite. How will we use our freedom? You're free either way. Paul didn't cancel the freedom. The finished work of Christ is a done deal. The paperwork is all signed. The envelope is sealed. It's over. He's redeemed his people. How will we use our freedom? I don't know what you do with a passage like this if you're here today and you're not a Christian. I've been talking about liberty or freedom. Paul's been talking about that. If you're not a Christian, you don't have it. You don't have liberty. You don't have freedom. Jesus said anybody who commits sin is a slave of sin. Jews condemned by the law in Romans chapter 2 Gentiles, that's not Jews, everybody else, has a conscience that will condemn you just as well as the law would. If you're not a Christian, you don't have liberty. You're a slave to sin. You can't stop if you try. You're also a slave to the coming judgment of God that will come and you can't get away. You're chained to the pole. There's no running away. Everybody is either under law and condemnation or in Christ. One or the other, never both. If you're not a Christian, you don't have a way out. You're under the law, condemned as a lawbreaker. It'd be just like being in jail. The law is written in black and white. You're on video, breaking the law. Talking about liberty, if you're not a Christian, you don't have to decide how to use your liberty because you don't have it. No prisoner sits in his cell thinking, how shall I use my freedom today? It's an absurdity. I want you to know that the liberty in the passage, the freedom, 
from the law and from condemnation and from sin itself, that great terrible power that has been on your back your whole life and you can't shake it off, that liberty comes from the Lord Jesus. It comes from what he's already done objectively in space and time in a country called Israel, in a city called Jerusalem, actually just outside the city gates where they put the trash, when he died on the cross. He suffered there so you don't have to. He became in that way trapped, so to speak. It was voluntary, but trapped under the law of God and the curses and penalties of that law so that you won't to free you. He purchased with his own blood your liberty when he died on the cross. He can set you free from sin, from a guilty conscience, which you keep pushing down to try to get rid of it. He can set you free from the future judgment of God. He can set you free from being so scared of death that you try so hard not to think of it by filling up your life with all kinds of other trinkets. And he's risen from the dead. What's he doing? Where is he? If he's risen from the dead, where's he at? He ascended. He's now sitting at the right hand of God doing what? Distributing liberty to everybody who will take it. Come out of the prison cells. Don't live your whole life as a slave of sin and then waiting in the cell for the judgment of God to come on the execution day. Don't do that. Jesus died to save you, to free you. He said himself, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In other words, if he comes and pulls you out of the cell, nobody puts you back in. What about for the Christian? As we conclude, the main application for the Christian is to use your liberty for the glory of God and the good of other people. That's the application. If you find that you're excited to do wrong because you hear that you can, that is, just to put it really bluntly, a very strong indication that you are not a Christian. Christians don't live like that. Christians are tempted and stumble and fall, yes. But a Christian is a sinner who repents, a sinner who cares about it, a sinner who doesn't want to sin, a sinner who depends on the grace of God to be forgiven and says, Lord, help me not to do that anymore. A non-Christian just goes on sinning because they can. If that's your response, you may well not be a Christian. Everybody can see that kind of response from a mile away. It's, very, it's a very obvious thing, the abuse of liberty. It's an ugly and obvious thing. Willful disobedience, or you could say hypocrisy. But one of the most important applications that I want to make for the church, for Christians, thinking of this willful disobedience, this dissolving morality, the people out of control, what's going to constrain them, thinking of that, the way to avoid that response, the misuse of liberty, is not to limit the grace of God in the gospel. Never, never, never limit the free grace of Christ in the gospel. The whole letter of Galatians is a command not to do that. It's the whole point. You're free in Christ apart from works. The solution when you see in yourself or other people a morality problem is not to threaten them with the law or to threaten yourself with the law, with fear of punishment. It won't change you. It won't change them. It won't change your kids. They may learn how to avoid the punishments, but it won't change their hearts. You can't get in there and do that to people. God has to do it. The true gospel has to remain free, all the way free, a free gift with no strings attached, no works required, no ministry requirements, no you can be accepted in Christ if, fill in the blank, no, nothing. In fact, one of the, Martin Lloyd jones said in his commentary on Romans, one of the marks of the true gospel is if you're preaching the real gospel, there will always be people who say, oh, if it's that free, people will abuse it. You say, oh, I'm preaching the real gospel, right? That's the objection that people gave to Paul in Galatians 6. Shall we sin so that grace may abound? Oh, if you're preaching like that and people are saying, if it's that free, no one will live right. That's a misunderstanding. But people only make that obje objection to the true gospel, to the free gospel, the gospel of God's grace, which depends on Christ only and not on you. 
So what should we do? Rest in the freedom won for us by the Lord Jesus. Embrace a salvation to which we contribute nothing. And don't place the burden of the law or any other burden, any other unbiblical requirements on anybody. Instead of burdening them, push them up and tell them how free and loved and righteous they are in Christ. And from there, knowing ourselves loved like that, let's love each other. With a king who loved, bled, died, and served the way that he did, and served you the way that he did, and me, let's respond by joyfully overflowing with that same love. When he pours his love into you, it overflows onto other people. When he serves you the way that he did, it overflows into service of other people. Not because you feel like you have to or else, but because you're genuinely full of love for him and for his people. That's the life he's called us to. That's what it looks like to walk in genuine Christian liberty.